Hello, everyone. Can you hear? It's a little noisy here. So I'll try to say uh, mid. Anybody hear me? Can hear you, Vipin. You're breaking up a little, but we can hear you. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I'm in the middle of this conference. Uh, but I'm recording and uh, uh, so we'll uh, start the meeting. But um, let me uh, just say to follow the agenda uh, so that uh, we do not engage in any uh, anti-competitive behavior and uh, also. Uh, Uh, well, consulting firm Peter and I see, and I would love to themselves, but uh, and also uh, we have uh, yeah we have to follow the code of conduct, which uh, essentially says that we should not be uh, we should be kind to each other. So uh, go ahead and introduce yourself, Srita. Uh, I would I call on each of the participants. Uh, Peter, Ram. <clears throat> yeah, hi, uh, Peter Ram, Peter Ram, and I am uh, a consultant in blockchain. Beautiful. Uh, keep the introductions as possible because we have to the main event very. This is Isaac Hunkel with Chainyard. Um, we're also a blockchain consulting company out of North Carolina. Hi, I'm Jagdish. I'm from Swaps of Inc. This is Morelli. I'm from uh, Hyperledger Fabric Maintainer. Hey, this is Paul DeMarzi. I'm the director of community with the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Uh, this is uh, Manny for Life on Flops Up. Hi, this is Bill Alder, uh, membership director with Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Hi, this is Ofer Vineri from the New York Security Token Exchange. Amanda Wilkie. Uh, yes, Amanda Wilkie. Uh, I would say, Mari, you should go ahead and uh, start the start your presentation. It will be recorded if you do not mind. Yeah, I will share it with you before I put it on. Yeah, no worries. Let me try to get my screen shared. Oh. Sorry, I have to set my Mac preferences to let Zoom share. Now I have to restart. <laughs> one more time. Hang on one second, folks. Um, All yeah, right, I'm back. back. <laughs> Sorry, the, the new um, security features that Apple has put in, um, they're good. But 
sometimes you have to remember that you haven't done it for every sharing app that you can remember. <laughs> All right, so let me get started. Um, Marley Gray with Microsoft and also the chair of the Token Taxonomy Initiative. I also um, sit on the board with the EEA um, and wanted to provide an overview of the Token Taxonomy uh, framework itself. Um, and uh, a good bit of back end and uh, background is, is helpful to understand what we're trying to talk about. First off, the Token Taxonomy Framework is the major output from an organization called the Token Taxonomy Initiative, which um, just so happens to share the same management, uh, staffing, and infrastructure, for the most part, with the EEA, but it is a separate organization. It is not an Ethereum aligned um, or specifically aligned uh, standards body, but rather um, it is neutral. And you'll see as we go through the token taxonomy framework um, why that is the case. Um, it has been broadly um, welcoming uh, really to everyone, uh, including all platform providers um, because of its neutrality, including um, most of the hype, all the main uh, ledgers in Hyperledger, uh, the Ethereum uh, variants, um, and um, things like R3, Corda, digital asset, um, Hedera Hashgraph, a um, whole bunch of others as well. But probably more importantly, it is probably most directly applicable towards non-technical um, business audiences that are focused on creating solutions and tools being, uh, excuse me, tokens being one of the tools that they um, are one of the new tools that look to potentially solve some of their uh, existing business problems and create new opportunities. So with that, let's quickly jump into what the taxonomy is and probably just as important what it's not. Um, it's number one goal is to essentially create common ground for educating um, and establishing common terms and definitions across the ecosystem so that we are speaking with one voice as an ecosystem um, in blockchain category, doesn't mean you have to be a blockchain to use this, but it allows us to speak to business people and technology folks, and even probably as importantly, regulators around the world and, and speak and not confuse them with terms that are either specifically out of financial services or specifically out of blockchain and, and uh, create a, a framework where we can, you know, everyone can articulate what it is that they're trying to do with a token uh, and talk about the business problems it's trying to, to solve. So from that, it establishes those common terms and definitions. And then underneath the covers, it is a composition framework. So it is built up of a whole bunch of different, what we call them artifacts, and they're just essentially business descriptions with metadata for individual components. And I'll go through this in just a moment that allow you to compose a token um, without knowing how to program anything, but rather understanding what the concepts are and modeling out what you would want uh, your token to be able to do and just as importantly not do. Um, and then it lets you create uh, this token definition, which as it turns out is a really solid set of technical requirements and business requirements that can be used to implement um, that token for a specific platform. It does not tell you how to implement it. It rather tells you, if you're gonna implement it, this is exactly what it should do. And then the notion behind that is when you have that and you've written it to that specification, we can then eventually certify that that token implementation meets the exact specifications that are in the token taxonomy definition. And we call that the specification. Now, we have not defined the um, certification process to date. We have a, a start on that. Um, but obviously there's a, if you've ever been in this business for a while, you have to uh, first agree with what you're going to standardize on and then how it's actually certified on each platform. The vendors and, and the, the actual platforms themselves will have to be able to lean in and, and help not only that, but you also have to have a way to, to actually certify and test it. Um, so those tools are going to be in development for a while, but that is the, the long sort of arc of what that is. So what is not is it's not blockchain specific. It is not a legal framework or a regulatory framework, but it's great common ground 
Um, and it's by design, not complete. It is intended to be a collaborative, very much community driven, open source sort of um, ecosystem where the framework um, entices folks to um, contribute uh, to increase the number of um, possibilities that people have. So I've done this presentation about a thousand times. So I'm going to, now that we have some visuals to show, I'm going to actually show you what, um, what the end of the road might look like. This isn't what it looks like at the moment, um, but we're racing towards this. And what you can expect an experience would be from a non-developer business person that you know, has gone through some basic training and, and maybe learned about the token and can begin to work with uh, this framework to design a token. So here's a uh, designer look and feel that you would look, it looks very similar to you know, most of these. Um, well, this at times now seems sort of old school, but um, if you've been around for a while and you remember how we used to have WYSIWYG UI designers where you would drag controls and plop them on a page and, um, and, and sort of create what your interface, user interface would look like. This is the same sort of scenario where you would start out and, and pick from, you have these different palettes of token bases. These are essentially the starting points uh, that you start with. And then you can grab from the various um, property sets and we'll talk about what those are in a moment. Behaviors and these things called behavior groups. Don't worry about what the terms are at the moment, but rather let's focus on you know, what the intent is. So if we go through this, you know, a user could come in and grab the single token or singleton token and drop it onto the design surface. And then along with that automatically, some of these are pre-configured to have um, behaviors already attached to them. So you, this singleton behavior is actually already attached. You just don't see it until you drag it on there. Um, and then from there you start dragging in this case, we're dragging property sets like the file property set and the bill of lading property set or, you know, whatever these property sets are. And they snap in to build the properties out this way um, of what those would be. And then the behaviors we grab over here from the palette of behaviors and we'll drag and drop behaviors to say, you know, it is transferable, it is a testable, it's loggable. And then, you know, we get to say save and call it bill of lading. Um, so this is our bill of lading document token. So this is a, since we're going to be scanning in a bill of lading and creating a token out of it and then describing, you know, that we could transfer it. It's a testable, it's loggable, but we're not finished with that. You know, we can go out and then you know, add different behaviors. So here's another example where you would start with a fractional fungible. Fractional fungible means that it is subdividable. So if it's subdividable, when I drag fun uh, fractional fungible, it automatically brings over subdividable. That's by definition gonna be there. Then I would say, how many decimal places do I want this fungible token to be subdividable by? And I would have a, I could simply click on subdividable, excuse me, <laughs> click on it, you know, pick the number of decimals. And then it would give an example of what it looks like. Um, same thing for you know, property sets. If I have a SKU property, and you know, I wanna set a max length on the SKU. How would I do that? I could type in a number and then a regular expression would you know, come into play. I wouldn't have to type the regular expression, but I could put in things like max length or, or put any other constraints that I wanted to and have that in the side. Now you'll notice over here, you could also do the same thing um, without having a pop-up window on the right-hand pane. I could change these properties. So it gives us a very sort of intuitive way. And I'm gonna point out a couple of other things as I um, continue, along, oops, yeah, continue along with this. You can also use it for education. So you can simply hover over something. And if I hover over the SKU, it tells me what the definition of a SKU property set is. But also over here, I can see you know, my token base is a fractional fungible. Here's the definition. And all of this text is coming from the framework. So the individual artifacts have all of this metadata in them. Uh, within these, their graphical visualizations of them are these artifacts that are in the token taxonomy framework. And it gives me you know, description, gives me some examples. Um, so I can use this user interface to surface the um, contextual information about uh, tokens as a user is designing that token or learning about that token. So you could pull up an existing token example like fab token or 
um, an ERC-20 variant uh, fungible that's, called, that's given a business definition like a loyalty point. And, and I could you know, hover over these and learn about that. What does this actually do? What does it mean as an education tool? So this again is, is um, you know, various things are being in development. I'll point out some things here. You'll see this thing called a token formula. I'm gonna go into all of these things in detail uh, in just the next, starting in the next slide of breaking this thing down. But I wanted to give you a feel for you know, how we envision this being used in the non-blockchain community. Um, but also, you know, it really should unlock sort of the concepts and the power across the broader ecosystem without sort of you know, starting with, you know, chain code or solidity or, you know, whatever. Uh, rather, let's, let's go back and, and model out what we're actually trying to do um, and, and put some real world language in there. Uh, so that end users can understand these concepts. Mm -hmm. So let's start breaking this thing down. Um, first, we have to, to define some predefined terms. Um, and we try to keep it at a minimum. And if you've been in programming for some time, these will look very, you know, oh, I, I kind of understand what these are and they kind of make sense. Um, but I'll start at the top. Um, we have this thing called a template or a token template, which is actually a composite in itself and it has two main parts. It has a formula and then it has a definition. So uh, I'll go into the, the details of those, but those two things combined create a template itself. Um, when you write an implementation based off of a template and someone deploys that, that becomes, uh, deploys that to a network, it becomes a, a class of that template type. So it's a deployed class and then individual tokens, depending on if it's fungible or if it's, you know, um, a non-fungible, you know, that uh, inst is what we call an instance. So it's an instance of that class. So um, that doesn't translate exactly to every platform, but it's more of a, a concept in establishing these terms. So when I'm saying the instance, I'm usually referring to what an end user would think of as the token in their wallet. You know, the balance that they hold. Those are instances of that token class. And from that token class is based off of the template specification of that. So that gives us sort of a, a set of high level terms. And within those terms, we say, okay, let's talk about, let's use an analogy with baking. So a token class is like a cake, a finished cake. You know, um, it's baked from a recipe, like a template. Um, a slice of the cake is a token instance. You know, you can have bigger or smaller slices. Um, uh, the cake is made of ingredients like milk, flour, sugar, and the like. That's the formula, right? The formula itself is just a list of ingredients. And then the definition it, are the specific um, instructions for how to mix the ingredients, how much of each ingredient is needed, how much milk, how much flour, how much sugar, when do you mix them together, all of those things, and then how long to bake it. So the template itself is essentially a recipe. It doesn't, now how you implement it, you know, the, the analogy starts to break down when you start getting <laughs> into the physics, but um, that, that's actually what we're talking about here. So, and the TTF ingredients are artifacts. Those are the individual milk, flour, sugar, things that are like standalone. They have the potential to have a quantity, for example, but they don't specify what that is until they're placed in context with an other ingredients in a recipe, like a template. And then once you bake the template, that's an implementation class. And then the instance is uh, a quantity of that class. Okay. So that's all sort of high level stuff. Um, let's now break into um, what a template formula is. So this is where, um, you'll usually start, a typical user would usually start, an end user would start with a, with a template formula. So that means you're going to try to compose or get all of the ingredients that you would need, like we did in the graphical designer, starting with a base token and grabbing all the behaviors and property sets that met our needs to create a template formula. And as you drag those things across and plop them on the design surface, under the covers, it's building this formula. And it has the, the base type and the formula for um, more sort of classification purposes, which we'll talk about in a minute. They have symbols and it looks like a mathematical formula, but it's very simple. 
it's just a way for logically grouping these things together and differentiate what's a behavior versus what's a property set versus a base of a token base itself. So you can see how the formula breaks out. And again, we're just talking about the formula here, not the definition, the formula itself. So those are visual symbols underneath the covers. Each one of these are, there are artifacts and they each have a unique identifier, which is just a GUID or a UID um, in the framework. Um, and it has a type, so you'll, you'll see that in a moment. And then from, once you have a formula, then you can say, I wanna create a definition from that formula. And what that does is it essentially goes out and um, because each one of these, a formula is just a reference to individuals. So this is a reference to milk, flour, sugar, but it doesn't say how much each one. It just says you're gonna need these things. These are just pointers or references. When you say I wanna create a definition, it creates a new artifact called a definition and it grabs essentially a copy um, of each one of these is called a, um, a reference, but it's essentially, um, uh, it grabs a, the, each of these things and puts them into a, a, a structure that you can then go in and specify um, my subdividable amount is uh, decimal places of two. Um, this is where you indicate what the settings are for that individual artifact in that context of the formula. And that'll be very, very specific for the template that you're defining. So if you're defining a you know, stable coin, it's, you know, in the US or most countries um, would have a um, decimal place of two, right? You're subdividable by two. Um, this is an example of, of that level of detail. So again, uh, this is our, our definition that we're pointing to. So formula, definition itself. Down here we have classes. So there, you'll see that the token class we use the same color to say, hey, it should have basically the same interface. It's just implemented differently underneath for a different uh, blockchain. So it also represents a common abstraction, which we'll get to in a moment. So that's the framework, uh, basically the how you sort of compose those things. And then you compose them of artifacts that are placed in the categories. And these categories are the base tokens. Uh, those are sort of your starting places. Property sets, um, which, I'll talk about each one of these in detail here uh, in, in subsequent slides. So property sets, you can think of just simple properties that have getters and setters and no heavy logic behind them, um, like a, a SKU, for example, or a, a PO number or something simple. Um, and the, but behaviors um, are really where we see most of the action, and that's where you're going to either define um, you know, a capability or a restriction and really put in some business language and perhaps regulatory or compliant uh, information in there. And the behavior groups are just a, a way to group, uh, create a template of behaviors that typically go together and have them pre-configured for a specific use case. So let's go through these real quick. All artifacts have this thing called an artifact. And all this stuff is, is essentially under the covers. It's um, uh, at runtime, um, if you will, it's just using protocol buffers. So you'll use, when you're working with artifacts in a, a programming environment, you'll use it just like native objects or whatever programming language you're using. We serialize it all to JSON in the GitHub repo. So the TTF is hosted in a GitHub repo. Um, and and just so happens, uh, Git is a really great place to do <laughs> collaboration uh, at this level where you can have multiple people contributing and we track all those changes because we're serializing to text. We can see what deltas are and, and manage um, the expansion of the framework over time. Um, anyway, these artifacts are just GitHub based. They're pretty simple structure. The folder structure is based essentially on these groupings and folders are named and then they have you know, the, the latest version and then subsequent versions can be uniquely identified. So you have multiple versions of the same artifact and then reference different versions as you compose those things together. Um, so it's a pretty straightforward, if you've done any tax, uh, your framework based work, it'll look and feel like any other framework. Um, so let's go through some of these first, like the base token types we have. Um, uh, you'll see the, the the fungible tokens. You have a this this is going to get a little bit in the clear uh, classification. I'll, I'm going to cover that much more in detail in the next slide. But here we have a common fungible, which is you know, the tau f, and then the uh, unique fungible, which is essentially 
a balance or account based fungible for common unique is UTXO. Um, so um, we think that same concept will apply to non fungible in certain platforms. So we just said, okay, let's just you know, let that you know, flow over to non fungible tokens, whether or not for an individual platform, it makes sense. We didn't want to restrict it yet. We may over time say, this is making sense. It's, it's confusing more people than it's worth, but we defaulted to, to not doing that initially. And then we have this notion of a hybrid and a hybrid is the way you would model out from a business perspective, things like a security. So a mortgage backed security would be a fungible parent with a bunch of child non fungible, well, logically mortgages. Um, each one, each mortgage is its own unique fung a non fungible. And then I can just issue you know, thousands of fungible tokens to allow me to sell fractions of that pool of mortgages. Um, you turn it on its head and you can then model out something with a, a non fungible parent, like a, uh, if Metallica is coming to a city and they're going to do a three, sh three day show, you know, you would have a non fungible token for each day of the show. And then you would have tranches of, or excuse me, classes of tokens, uh, one for general admission, those are fungible. And then you could have reserve seating, which now that they've gotten old, I guess you kind of want to do that for Metallica concert. You could, you know, buy reserve seating and get like premier seats with, you know, ear, earplugs. Uh, so you don't go deaf in your old age. Anyhow, um, reflecting a little bit too much of my last experience at a Metallica concert. <laughs> so hybrids let you sort of model these things out. How they're implemented, you know, it really varies by platform. Um, but we don't want to restrict people's concept of building tokens based on what uh, underlying platforms can and can't do. We didn't want to, by design, we did this very early on as to say, listen, we can't, we don't want to bring any restrictions or you know, capabilities um, and explicitly restrict um, the framework itself to not being able to have a concept just because it doesn't make sense for that platform. Uh, that's not the intention here and we don't want to do that. So let's talk about classification. This is super important for once you start to understand this better, this is, this becomes sort of um, really, really important. It helps you sort of uh, guide customers and regulators as to sort of what the big picture is. So the first is the token type is either fungible or non fungible. Those are the fundamental differences. I'm not gonna spend time covering what those are right here right now. But um, from there, then you say, okay, what's my token unit? Is it fractionable whole or is it a singleton? A lot of people get hung up on the whole or singleton. And so what the singleton and non fungible and well, we've seen scenarios where non fungible tokens can actually be subdivided. Um, so I might have a non fungible art token, but I can have, I could then subdivide that and say you own a quarter of the Mona Lisa without me having you know, this weird multi sig type thing. Um, but the, the whole uh, token itself is a, a non fungible whole. Anywho, it's, it's not an implementation detail. It is you know, what is the unit from a business perspective. There should be one of these, only one, and it cannot be um, subdividable. So that's a singleton. Whole is essentially saying you're dealing with whole numbers, fractional, we already talked about subdivision. The next one is value type, whether it's intrinsic or reference. So intrinsic value is a cryptocurrency. It's not backed by any asset, no real world asset behind it. Um, so that is what we call an intrinsic references. Um, where we're seeing a lot of the action now is it's actually referencing a commodity or a, um, a piece of property of some sort or backed by a pool of like Libra backed by a pool of, um, of, of currencies. Um, anyway, that's a, a reference type. Um, the second is, or the fourth, sorry, is representation type, common and unique. We just talked about this in the last slide, whether it's common, uh, fungible, sorry, um, UTXO versus balance. If you say that to a business person, you're never going to get past um, the discussion. But if you go and say, hey, it's common and unique, what does that really mean? And we talk about properties and, and give them business scenarios for like if you have a whole bunch of tokens that they, they should all share a SKU number and you have to change the SKU a year after it's been out there, that becomes a problem changing that SKU uh, for all the tokens that are out in the wild if they're all unique. Uh, that's a business problem, right? It's not really a, you know, there's ways to solve that, but you have to think about it up front. You know, how would I address this, um, you know, as you go forward. And the fifth one is the t a template type. Now this is a template typing because 
when you're defining a token, you sort of define it as an individual thing. Then you can put it in parent and child relationships after it's been defined. Now you can then combine them and say it's a single token, meaning there are no child tokens, or if it's a hybrid, it can be a parent with one or more children. And a child token can actually have, uh, be a hybrid itself, which can create very complex, um, model very complex business uh, scenarios. So um, these are the, the definitions. I just walked through all of these um, so that you guys are going to get these slides. So you'll be able to you know, see the, the details here and, and read these. These are all in the uh, markdown as well. That's publicly available uh, in the documentation for the framework. But this is a good slide if you're trying to communicate it to a larger audience. So let's go into the individual artifacts. These are again are the individual sort of recipe ingredients themselves. So properties themselves, let's back up a little bit and talk about properties. Properties are either behavioral or non-behavioral. If you've been programming for some time, this makes a heck of a lot of sense. We have sort of a, a behavior, um, um, excuse me, a regular property set. It's just like a regular property or a um, uh, something that has a, just a getter and a setter, meaning you're going to set the value without a ton of logic um, and you can get the value and you're expecting that property to be queryable um, for an object of that class uh, in a programming language, for example. Um, that's what we would call a property set. It's kind of doesn't require a lot of logic to set the value. Um, We'll talk about behaviors in a minute. You have behavioral properties that are not exposed or they're dependent on a behavior to set its value. That's what we call a behavioral property. It should not be defined as a property set. So it's a sort of a, for people that haven't been programming for a long time, this is sort of a, you have to kind of figure that out. But for the most part, we're saying it's something like a skew, uh, who the issuing organization is, um, something like that. The denomination or the, um, the, the fiat, currency backing the stable coin or whatever um, would be a you know, property that we would look at. Um, so these things have a symbol of, um, you'll see the fee skew, which is um, essentially in the formula, how, you, how you're there and you, you go in there. So the most important thing there is when you're putting this in a token definition, you can set things like property restrictions. You know, it could be, you know, seven characters long, the first two characters are numeric, followed by a dash and then the less rest, or so you would put expression validation things in there to, to put business rules for those individual properties. Behaviors themselves, again, this is where the vast majority of the, of uh, we'll see, well, I say that, we, we think, well, this is where most people will like pivot to and they'll think about behaviors. They're either a capability or restriction. So something can be transferable or it can be non-transferable. Um, now that's essentially the same behavior, but one's just, just the opposite. And you'll see how we use the, the tilde symbol for that to indicate, indicate the opposite. Um, um, and then a behavioral property. These are properties that are buried within the behavior definition. So if you have a property that is, can only be set by a particular behavior that should be defined in the behavior itself. Um, so uh, we'll talk about like subdividable has a decimals property. Um, now, how you implement it, again, this is just for the definition to make it readable. Now, the interesting bit about this is behaviors are also where we think, uh, behaviors to property sets are where, where you'll see we'll certify these things, at least surface level, because they are essentially describing the interface of the token, um, meaning you know what properties are exposed publicly and then what behaviors are accessible um, out there as well. So when we describe a behavior in a property set, both of those, we have these things called control messages and they're simple, you know, um, you would say I have a, a behavior, this is how I invoke it. We describe it as messages, transfer request, as a transfer response. The transfer request has, you know, requires these fields and a response will include this as a receipt and it is not a programming, um, but it does let people describe, you know, when I'm, uh, if I've described a um, behavior, uh, sorry, a property set like uh, insurable um, or a behavior called insurable, where I want to have proof of insurance on a bill of lading, for example, then the insurance company can define, these are the, the values or the consortium would define, these are the values that we're going to prove insurable. Um, when we like insure a bill of lading, we call the insurable behavior, we're going to set these property values. 
So I'm going to pass in you know, some cryptographic proof, you know, you know, identifier, you know, certain things, and that'll be uh, the insurable uh, behavior. Um, and they can define that and they'll define those control messages. And then you can just uh, apply insurable, you know, to any type of token to say, you know, it should be insurable. So it's going to expose this interface and have, you know, set these properties, not how it's done, but uh, essentially this is where uh, these control messages are describing. Um, you, you have the option um, in the, the taxonomy, you describe them as very simple, um, a nesting of, you know, I have a request and a response and you just name the message and you know, give it some optional parameters and, and what you expect them to be, not what the values are, but, you know, description, you know, the receipt should include a, you know, transaction hash and a block ID or, you know, whatever you want to put in there. Um, you have the option of also modeling that out in protocol buffer um, messages as well. Not required. Um, some people have done it automatically just to make it easy. But we anticipate control messages is where the majority of the focus on certification will happen. We come with a, a palette of, you know, a handful, uh, more, maybe two handfuls of common behaviors, and they're just, you know, pretty standard standalone things. So transferable is T, non-transferable is tilde T, so it's the opposite. Uh, subdividable and whole is the same. So you'll see we're we're not we're trying to reserve these symbols. A singleton is essentially saying that it's uh, non-subdividable and it um, has a quantity of one. Um, mintable, roll support, burnable. We'll go through some of these as we go through. So you'll have a, a sort of a, a rich palette of these available. Now behavior groups are ways to grab a bunch of different behaviors and there's pre-configure them. So we, we have one example in the framework called supply control, which has mint, burn, and roll support. And what it does is says, I'm going to model out the ability to create new supply and also remove supply. So that's mint and burn, but I want to enforce it with roll. So only certain uh, people or people in a role or counts in a role can mint new tokens. So I'm going to grab roles in there and I'm going to say, there's going to be a group called mentors or a role named mentors, however it's implemented, call it mentors. And that should have add member, remove member, you know, and have a uh, pre-check of, you know, is in role and check that membership anytime someone calls mint. So if somebody calls mint or um, it, it should check, you know, is the caller in role um, to do that. And that sounds kind of trivial, but this allows us to predefine that and have it be a behavior group that's re, um, instead of having to grab each one of these and reconfigure that again for that specific function, we just you know, compile them together into this thing called supply control. Now that's sort essentially the shortcut underneath the covers and the definition, you'll see all those behaviors and, but they already have these settings set. So you don't have to do that work. Again, we talked about referencing a lot. One of the main things we try to do in the taxonomy is not duplicate data. As, well, you try, you, you, you remove as much duplication as you possibly can. When somebody gets to a definition, it's sort of, and you're pulling over the artifact itself, it's essentially copying the, the, the basic values or things that had values, and then you can change them in the definition. In some sense, you'll have some duplication there. Um, but if you don't change a value in the definition that has no uh, value set, um, or it sets to the default, it'll just stay with whatever the default is in the base artifact itself. Um, but it is, anyway, a reference is just a, that reference. Um, here it's not just a, a pointer to the artifact, but it actually lets you set the values um, of that reference the actual artifact itself. So here's our term formula. We already talked about this. This is sort of walking through that same concept where you know, template formula again is just a list of ingredients, but then from a template formula, you create the definition. And this is where you're getting the individual references to the individual artifacts and putting in the values for each one of those uh, that apply to the artifacts in context uh, for that uh, formula. The token specification is a document that's generated. Um, you don't create a token specification. You create, a, ultimately, you're, uh, the, the token specification is created from the template definition. So the template definition has a unique ID, just like every artifact has a unique ID. And you can say, hey, 
print the tokens or create a token specification from this definition ID, and it will generate an open XML document um, that you can then you know, open in Word or Google Docs uh, and print it out. Um, you can save it to PDF, whatever you want to do with it. But it, it is generated again. If, if you see something, you print this thing out and you see typos in it because Word's really good at catching <laughs> grammatical errors and stuff like that. Can't, don't change the specification, go change the definition because it came from your definition. And you might have to say, oh, it's not actually in the definition, it's actually in the artifact. So you would need to like crawl back to the artifact itself and say there's a typo in your business description of this behavior. And I can make that modification in my, um, in my tool. And this, what it's doing is it's modifying your local Git um, branch. And then when you issue a pull request, we'll see that essentially go, oh, yes, let me fix this typo um, or made this sentence read better. Um, and that's just going to improve the overall quality of the framework. But essentially, that's what a uh, you know, specification is. It's a printed, uh, human readable uh, format. And the, the tool, all the tools that are, I'll be talking about, I'm going to show you in a minute, come in the framework itself and are self contained. Here's some just rules on grammar. I'm not going to dwell on a lot of these. You can read a lot of these things in the documentation. I'd rather get to Q&A as quickly as possible, leave as much time there. Um, but you can see this, these are rules for how we create the, the grammar itself. I've had lots of uh, Microsoft researchers like enamored with this grammar and they're, they're running wild with this because you can do all sorts of things with uh, code generation, uh, formal verification. Um, but it, you know, it, it's actually quite useful. We primarily use um, the formula grammar just for classification um, and for visualization and how you sort of visually uh, create these things. I'll show you what these things look like in a moment. Um, here's just some more grammatical rules. Like you can state a behavior is incompatible with others. Some are just obvious, like you can't be transferable and non-transferable. Uh, it's just you're either one or the other. Um, but you might have some that um, behaviors can influence other behaviors. Like they don't make sense standalone. And that is like one called delegable is an example. So delegable means that I can delegate uh, another behavior that I apply delegable to, to another party to do on my behalf. So this is typically, I'm going to give my broker, uh, they can transfer on my behalf up to a certain number of tokens without you know, going through some business process. Um, that's what we call delegable. Delegable makes no sense by itself. It has to be applied or influence another behavior. So you'll see that. Um, here's the, the classifications. We start things, we build these natural hierarchies where you have this sort of generic base token as abstract. Nobody creates just a base token. And you have branches, fungible, non-fungible, and hybrids. And from underneath each of those, it will branch out till you get to actual uh, definitions themselves and you can visually see you know how a fiat currency relates to a stock you know what are their common parents and things like that none of this is like uh, actually the the, the hierarchy is dynamic you can pivot it and create new trees visually from the metadata um, so we're seeing all sorts of interesting ideas and I'll show you some examples of that in a minute um, the hierarchy itself we just use the um, we start with uh, branches that start with the uh, fungible, non-fungible. Uh, we, we initially started with just fungible, non-fungible, but we, we said, you know, you have to declare you know, what is a subdividable capability sort of upfront. So let's just you know, cut to the chase and, and not confuse everybody with all these different bases. And so we said, we'll create five bases and you have you know, fractionable, fungible, and whole fungibles. You have non-fractionable, uh, fungible, uh, so, sorry, whole fungible, non-fungibles and frac um, fractional non-fungibles and then singletons. And then you have this hybrid, which could be any combination of those in parent-child relationship. Um, the branches from there sort of visually go out and say, what is your, your base token? Um, and if it's a hybrid, what is the, the, the parent base and what type of it is that? Um, so then this is just goes and again how the hierarchy is built this is more for people that want to create new visual hierarchies and pivot on uh perhaps um unique versus um common you could you pivot the the, the tree like that as well the token templates you know map to individual um definitions themselves as a part of the template and you'll see like 
end users will see physical names um, underneath the covers that will have a reference to its parent formula. Um, here's a artifacts are structured hierarchically. This is a, the visualization of the folder structure in, in GitHub. So it has an artifacts folder and then it just has subfolders for the different classes and you'll see each um, each folder itself will have the latest um, which is the latest version. They have individual version folders itself. The tooling and metadata has some interesting stuff built in there as well. Um, each uh, artifact has what we call a set of maps and those maps are essentially pointers to either source code for a particular implementation, it could be finished um, solution, it could be like a, so like a behavior can point to a source code snippet, uh, like on open Zeppelin or somewhere like that, or it can point to a finished um, uh, source code that completely implements that or to a solution. You know, maybe it's something, you know, on AWS or Google that you've already set up and it's ready to go, or it's your solution that you've, um, that you've got ready. Somebody can discover uh, your implementation just by using the tools and, and get the, the framework itself. And then the other type of reference is something called a, um, an artifact um, resource reference, which could point to regulatory guidance, for example. So if there's regulatory guidance for a stable coin, uh, we would have uh, individual mappings to the regulatory guidance, maybe by jurisdiction, SEC, MAS, you know, whatever we would have. Um, we would map that in. Um, so maps, you can have those rich, and that's really extensible. You can sort of do whatever you want to with it, and we anticipate that might, um, that becomes in handy for things like CodeGen as well. So if you're gonna start building tools off of this, you could create metadata and submit it and you know have it you know, be in the, the framework itself. The model when you get it, so we get sort of to the, when you, you can actually grab the entire object model and then navigate it like this. So I can say, give me the whole taxonomy, or one go, and it will return back a, depends on your platform, like if it's in Java or C Sharp or Go, you'll get an object so that has a nested you know, class, list of these objects or collections. And you can just navigate through this and, and look at these objects themselves. You don't need to worry about reading JSON or serializing it, just use the, programming interface and protocol buffers and as a gRPC interface on the front, pretty straightforward, really easy to use. Um, one of the things that I'd like to talk to people that have been doing this for a while is to sort of say, you know, when you, you start declaring things like financeable, doesn't mean that your token is going to implement finance logic, but rather it's indicating that your token will support uh, being encumbered or attached or related to a contract either on the same blockchain or something, some other completely different system. Um, and it will have the hooks in there to support the essentially cryptographic linking of a token to some other legal contract or something else somewhere else uh, so that you can quickly correlate those and, and trigger those and encumber things. So I could, you know, have the financial behavior on a property title for a loan contract that's on a completely different network that you can't get to, but I will not be able to trade or burn that property title because it's encumbered using the financeable behavior. So the loan contract would have to go in and you know um, remove that encumberment by whatever the business process is in that loan contract. So it's really a way to you know, define these contract interfaces. Now they're not purely contract interfaces, but that's more of a concept we're trying to get people to really really, really, really hammer home that tokens are not contracts and contracts are not tokens. It shouldn't be, now they might be implemented using the same technology and you might say, oh, this is like on Ethereum, it's a token contract. Well, it's not, it, okay, tokens are t contracts, you know, technically, but it's confusing to the rest of the world. Um, so we don't wanna do that. We wanna say tokens are this, this concept, contracts typically will, dictate the rules of how we transfer or utilize contracts or tokens as mediums of exchange or value between ourselves. So let's not you know, commingle those things together. I'm about to wrap up here. Here's an example of the classification hierarchy. This is a dynamic view. You could sort and pivot this however you wanted to. Um, here's the old design. You saw the new design. Um, this is actually sort of, this is what it looks like. We have um, some different tools in the works. Um, 
we describe a, a workshop process where we want partners and members, um, industry organizations to use the TTF um, as a place to record the outcomes of a workshop. We don't describe how you do a workshop. That you know could be a pre-sales engagement. It can be a, a, a exercise and a meetup for a, a vertical industry group. But you would go through and you can define individual artifacts and then record those in the token taxonomy tools so that you can contribute them and have those be reusable. So that becomes like in the insurance industry, you want to ins you want to define the insurable behavior and these properties that are valid for insurance so that the supply chain groups will just reuse those artifacts so that you'll get the goodness across vertical groups. Um, last, no, this is the last slide before we go to Q&A. The TTF ends where implementation begins, essentially. Um, TTF essentially stops at the specification and definition. Um, and then it has links to where you can point to implementations, whether it's source code, the implementation, or reference material. So with that, I'll stop. I do have some, you'll see it in the next slides, but I wanted to leave time for questions. Hi, this is Jim Mason. Um, I unfortunately arrived late to the presentation, but this thing is fantastic as a, an architecture. So if you look at it, what's brilliant about it is you've modeled beautifully in the formulas, the, um, the taxonomy has modeled very well what I call the behavior side of life um, for different token use cases. And what that does is because then the metadata, in a sense, exists as a definition, it provides the opportunity brilliantly to um, automate a lot of the, um, from the model, um, you know, onto the actual uh, implementation, which is excellent. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. It wasn't, you know, it's a community effort. <laughs> so uh, and I anticipate the folks on the call, we want you to help us do this. And this is, this is like call to action for everybody. It's like lean in, help us out here. Okay. Uh, this is uh, Manny from SwapSub. Uh, what kind of a uh, tooling is available, or at least in the early stages, uh, for modeling these things? Uh, Very good question. So <clears throat> we have, um, the, in the, if, when you clone the GitHub repo, when you first clone it, there are tools in there. The first is that you'll see the raw artifacts folder. And don't go there, I mean, unless you just really love model, you know, editing JSON directly. Rather, there's a... We have an object model to find in a separate folder. You can navigate this. It's all clearly documented. But there are tools in there, and one is called the taxonomy service. The taxonomy service is essentially a CRUD, create, read, update, and delete, CERC gRPC service that you can stand up. And it will uh, essentially load the taxonomy. So when you clone it, it will load from your local artifacts folder and create the object model that we call it the TOM. And the TOM. <laughs> is essentially that structure we showed. And then you can just make a single call to that service and say, hey, give me the whole TOM. When it's local, it's not that big a deal. You can get the whole thing and have it in memory. And when it's in memory, we, we show you the client. We have a sample client that goes through and creates new artifacts. You can modify artifacts. You can um, create a, a definition from a template and you can print specifications. So the print, the, the ability to print them. So we have the basic uh, object model, the um, the service that serves up the object model um, and supports reading uh, updates and deletes to that so that but it does it to your local copy so if you accidentally delete a bunch of artifacts um, until you issue a pull request no one else is going to see it so you can shoot yourself in the foot and delete it and start all over again if you want to um, uh, so that's that's a good thing um, and then so it has that with a sample client that's more the lowest level where we'll soon have, um, I was hoping to have it you know, this week, it looks like it might be next week, but there'll be a, a browser interface, very simple taxonomy browser that's essentially read only. So someone can go and look at each artifact and read them without having to clone the repo or browse the GitHub repo and look at each artifact in JSON, which is not a really pleasant experience. Um, and that's one. And then the, the other tools that are in development are the Visual Modeler that you saw, um, uh, Microsoft, we're building one here at Microsoft for Visual Studio Code. That's actually, a set, we want it to be reusable and we're donating that into um, 
to this so you can host it in your own website you don't have to use visual studio code it's just a set of react pages um so we're, we're sort of contributing that um and then we have other partners so the we're trying to create an ecosystem of people using this as tooling because once you have the grpc service up and running you can grab the taxonomy object model on any platform whether it's web java go net you name it um and then do whatever you want to with it programmatically because it's very easy to work with at that point um and create your own tool so we've had um some people think of the the printer as a tool that's just uh using the open xml object model to create word documents or uh, open xml documents themselves so those are the tools we we've sort of put a call to action to is uh, to the tool manufacturers or tool tool makers uh, we have uh, three projects in flight right now the one at um, in the TTF itself for the web uh, application. Um, we have um, one and the Visual Studio Code team, and then we have one that is, um, actually has some tools around the workshopping uh, that a, a company called Inter uh, Envision Blockchain has been building uh, around sort of the, the, the process itself, but also you're looking at building tools to um, facilitate workshopping itself. Mm -hmm. Hey, Marlon. It's, it's, it's been a, a great uh, presentation. Thank you for coming. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is, uh, you know, you did mention that um, parts of the role, uh, uh, roles definitions, which would have um, identity implications. I would uh, uh, ask you to present on the identity working group on, on those uh, topics. The other thing is, uh, you mentioned that you know there was a reference token and another kind of token, but uh, reference token implies some kind of a real world um, interaction. So, would you uh, uh, say that you need some kind of custodian or something like that to implement that reference token? No, the the reference versus value is. Uh, the value uh, is reference versus intrinsic. So it just me simply means the value of the token is referenced elsewhere. The, the token itself by itself yeah, is yeah, not. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, that, uh, that's it. And we don't take it any farther. We, we, we want people to define sort of custodial behaviors or behavior groups. And that's, you know, we're, we're encouraging people to look at that and, and, we have lots of people rushing to custodial implementations without really defining what does it mean for custodial services. And I think that's an awesome exercise that somebody could use the token taxonomy to model the business process after. Hint, hint. <laughs> but I, I agree with you. That's a totally, that's a huge area. Um, yeah. Just, yeah um, to follow up on that is that, you know, we are part of the, I'm not sure if you have noted the common yep. domain model for the capital markets. Um, so where we go through all these and details of contracts, and how these contracts are defined in the real capital market world. And, and definitely I see at some point where there's an actual transfer of value comes in, uh, the token taxonomy and, and the artifacts is very, very useful. Uh, I had actually asked uh, some of these uh, working group members to participate. So uh, I, I think uh, at, at some point we would like to reach out and see how this could be incorporated into the CDM uh, modeling, into, into a CDM modeling itself. Yeah, I, I think the same way. Um, and we purposely sort of really, when we scope this out, we said this is not about contracts, right? It's just tokens. Uh, and, yeah. and that uh, is the work that they've done. Um, is actually, we would want to have this be integrated with. Right. They complement each other, yeah. honestly. Yep. Yeah, at some point, I probably would, would, would like you to you know, come in and just give a quick intro to our to the working group so that that could kickstart the, the effort of uh, integrating the contract work with the token token. You guys have done a great job. Great. And the last question is, um, how do you see Hyperledger, the Hyperledger community interacting with this uh, particular uh, effort at PDF? Uh, very good question because we don't deal with implementation. Um, there are a couple of things that we would look to do is um, we are very interested in creating uh, frameworks, implementation frameworks for how you would. Uh, so a lot of the certifications for um, 
creating, like if you create a token spec, how do you certify it for high pleasure fabric? We think it could be a, should be a project within the high pleasure fabric community. Mm -hmm. Say, hey, we've got we've got this, and then perhaps provide you know, wrappers and starters and uh, SDKs for creating TTF compliant tokens on Hyperledger 2.0 or Fabric 2.0. Or um, we've actually we made we have a product called Azure Blockchain Tokens that we just announced, and it's all about this as well. It's not about defining tokens, but how do we create a uh, snap in model where so anyone can write a token for any platform, whether it's high pleasure fabric or R3 mm -hmm. Corda or, but, but have a common interface. And so that's one that we've you know, said when we're ready, we want to you know, do this and we'll do that in the hyper ledger fabric um, ecosystem because it's an implementation that we want to have brought everyone sort of come into. So we haven't formally proposed that, but that's like, we're really close. Um, and because we, we think that's super important. Uh, and uh, you're right. I'm sorry. I think, I'm sorry. sorry. I think we have to uh, close the meeting now because I think some people from the next meeting are already here. Sorry, Peter. I saw your hand up at the last month, minute. Uh, we will uh, uh, interact uh, with Marley on the mailing list or somehow in an asynchronous manner. I'm going to stop the recording and I'm going to ask, uh, uh, I'm going to thank uh, Marley again for appearing and giving such a lucid explanation of a very complex topic. Thank you, Molly. Thank you.